function-based assess and address antecedents and consequences, provoking experiences, social consequences, positive reinforcement, active rewards, negative reinforcement, escape consequences. What the heck does that mean? So the story when we're teaching parents about this is Billy, who comes home, he's nine. His sister is a high school student. Um, she's sitting watching TV. Billy comes in and starts barking and grunting and moving and shaking and doing all kinds of stuff. And his sister says, you know, shut up. You're bugging me. You know, get out of here. I hate you. And Billy says, you know, it's my Tourette. You should be nice to me. Mommy told you to be nice to me because I have Tourette. And he says, I don't care whether you have Tourette. You're a pain in the butt. I hate you. Get out of here. I'm trying to watch TV. Billy says, Mommy, and Mommy comes in and says, what's going on? And it's like, she's saying that she's being horrible to me. She doesn't understand that I have Tourette and that. And the, kid, mom, the daughter looks at the, the, the parent and says, you know, he's so obnoxious. He is so obnoxious. And the mother says, I don't like your attitude. Go to your room. So the teen girl gets sent to the room. And as soon as she's left the room, Billy goes over to the television and changes the channel. Got the picture? The next time Billy goes in that TV room, he may have a burst of ticks because it allows him to have the TV room to himself so that he can change the channel. Kids get tired, start doing their homework after dinner. I've had parents cry watching their kids' ticks get worse during homework. Um, back rubs, bacon cookies, one family does foot rubs. Notes to the teacher saying he couldn't do his homework last night because his ticks got to be too bad. All of those consequences, if they provide a direct reward for tick severity, like a back rub or a foot rub or hot, fresh baked cookies, or a note to the teacher allowing them to escape from responsibilities, are all going to inadvertently reinforce tick severity over time. So everything that you do from your gut that is intuitive to care for a suffering child <laughs> may, from a behavioral point of view, be awful. So parents go, oh my God, that's all we do. I mean, I'm giving him a back rub all the time. It's turned into, he can't go anywhere. I give him a back rub after he gets up in the morning. I give him a back rub after school. I do it you know, before dinner. I mean, he's getting a million back rubs a day. I said, well, you're going to keep giving him back rubs, and you know what? His ticks are going to continue to be there. They're not going to get better with that intervention. So families say, well, what do you do? You can't just be cold and cruel. Well, in our treatment program, we ask them to work on their exercises before they do their homework so that they're coming into their homework kind of prepared and then to use their exercises during their homework to get through their homework without having tick exacerbation. Um, we ask families when the kids do their homework to give them a back rub after they do their homework. Because now you're given a back rub for a behavior that you want to see them do more frequently, not for their ticks and tick-related distress. So we turn the family's world upside down from an intuitive one where you're reacting to the pain and suffering of a child to one where you're empowering the child to take charge and you're rewarding them for coming out on top and doing what they need to do to manage as best they can their ticks. Does that make sense? It's a completely different lifestyle orientation. And it comes from here because it's counterintuitive. It does not come from here and it does not come from here. The sad part about it is most of our management of kids who have problems comes from here and it comes from here. And it gets us just into these kinds of behavioral cycles, which actually don't help kids get out of the, out of the problem. So we work with families um, around all of this kind of stuff. See, we've seen, we see very complicated ticks. Um, and, um, and some of them are so woven into, some of the more complicated ticks are so woven into reinforcement cycles, functional reinforcement cycles escape from academic stuff, escape from chores, escape from sibling kind of responsibilities or family responsibilities. So ticks will take kids out of action in that way. And then there's all kinds of gratification that parents do to make their kids feel better when they're ticking to kind of help them relieve the suffering associated with that. And we really try and clean that stuff up. So we've written for many years prescriptions, can't leave the classroom at any time to kind of do his ticks. 
Now what we're saying is let's identify during the school day when you're going to kind of do your exercises so that during those periods of time where your, your tics traditionally escalate, like prior to gym class when you're doing some kind of exciting thing, let's make sure that the teacher knows and uh, that you're going to do a little bit of your exercises kind of quietly in place and the teacher can go. And then you'll be ready for gym class and you'll be in a good place. And then the teacher reports to the kid, gives them the thumb up. The report goes back to the family that the kid's doing what he's supposed to be doing. The family's pleased. They reward the heck out of the kid for his tick management strategies. The kid got to play in gym that day, didn't get overexcited. You, it creates a lifestyle, if you will, that tumbles in a very positive way forward. Um, and, and it really, it's, it's just a complete change in the advice than we've done forever. It, ADHD kids are troublesome. In our study, we did, this was a kind of an individual psychotherapy style approach. So in a clinical treatment trial, when do you see kids for individual psychotherapy? After school. When do stimulants wear off? After school. So our data suggests that kids with ADHD got better, but they didn't do quite as well as kids who don't have ADHD. So Barbara Coffey's actually pre-treating, before therapy, giving kids stimulants before they go into therapy um, so that they actually have good attention and concentration prior to the therapeutic experience so they can actually learn under the, under the value of stimulants. From my point of view, these are skills that people can learn no matter what. I mean, this is, um, I'll never be Tiger Woods, but I can probably get better. Um, you know, there are some people who are horrible golfers and never be any good. Um, if they love the game and they keep practicing, they might get better at it, but it's going to take some people more work because they don't have any kind of an intuitive sense for kind of how to make their body mechanics work to hit a golf ball. But it's, but but my concern is that the, the behavioral principles which underlie this are universal. So there's nothing we're talking about that we don't do with OCD, that we are currently doing with post-traumatic stress disorder. We're doing strategies like this for depression. Um, these are universal behavioral strategies that are associated with health and well-being. And there are people who have more trouble doing them. But at that point, I don't think about complementary or alternative treatments, I think about bearing down, getting to the nitty gritty, working harder, and seeing if I can get a person instead of 40% better, maybe 15 or 20% better. Because the inherent value of doing some of these things, the, the empowerment that kids experience is worthwhile, even if it's harder for them to do. So as a behavioral person, I, I know that people have a hard time doing some of it. It's just that you've got to buckle down and work harder with them. You have to be more creative as a therapist. You've got to find the right moment to have them in therapy. You've got to do all kinds of stuff to kind of optimize the opportunity for people to pick up these skills. But for me, it's no different than learning how to play a musical instrument or learn how to play a sport, um, get good at some kind of game or other kind of leisure activity. Uh, there are some things you're going to be naturally good at, some things you're not going to be naturally good at. If you really love the game and you're naturally good at it, you can play. You're just going to have to work harder to kind of build your skill set. And um, the alternative to say that they can't, for me, is a, is a real trap. Because if you say he can't because he's got ADHD, then all of a sudden you set up that important behavioral principles are not going to be available to a person, even though it may be difficult for them to implement. Does that make sense? It's that piece. And so... The shift from it's going to be hard to he can't includes with it permission not to necessarily use bona fide behavioral strategies to manage one's life. And that I, I don't do. I'm trying not to stigmatize people because they can't. I don't want to say they're a bad person because they can't. But that's not my style anyway. My style is, oh my gosh, this is much harder for you than it is for other people. Let's just kind of what can we do to make it easier? What can we do to buckle down? Is there another way to practice? Can I convince you about doing it a different way? But in the end result, we kind of got to get you understanding these principles and finding a way in your own, within your own self to do it. I, I use find a way a lot with kids. I actually had one little girl who got a bracelet that put find a way on it. Because these are kids who are creative about their own bodies and they get themselves. And so when I know where they want to get and I want to get them there too, I say, listen, I can teach you five skills, but at some point you're going to have to find your way to that end point. So what can we do to help you find your way? And I say, you know, I've given you three skills today. Practice those. But I also want you to experiment and find your way 
It's an empowering message that puts them in charge of trying to figure themselves out using the skills that we've taught them. That, that kind of approach, it still may not work, um, but it doesn't abandon the basic principles of kind of health and well-being. It says the principles are there. It's just that people may have to adapt or use or approach those strategies a little different in order to be acceptable. What we're talking about with kids is there are some people who have an easier time, some people who have a harder time. If, if they have a much harder time, we have the choice to cut them slack and remove the responsibility or find a way to kind of put them in a position to be able to achieve their own goals. Um, and for me, that's a much better approach to take. And the principles that, that inform us about how to do that are really these behavioral principles. So that's why learning this language is a really big deal. What I tend to see most therapists do is if kids don't respond, they abandon ship and they do a completely complementary or alternative treatment. They don't stick with the fundamental process. So um, I liken it to the fact if you're playing tennis and all of a sudden you've kind of lost your stroke, you don't turn the racket around, hold the head by two hands, and try and hit the tennis ball with the handle. But that's what we see happening in mental health. Instead of going back to the fundamentals, which is to hold the tennis racket, work on your grip, get to the practice area, get your coach, and practice over and over again the shot that's difficult for you to do until you get back on your game again, even if it's very difficult, it's a shot that you've had trouble with your entire tennis career and it's very difficult for you, that strategy is to go back to basic fundamentals and practice. So kids who have a hard time learning because they've got learning challenges or ADHD, they're just going to have to work harder and they're going to have to practice more. But to abandon the basic fundamentals of you know, human functioning because it's hard for somebody to do, that one doesn't make sense for me. Again, about half of people get better with the conventional manualized treatments. But in the hands of a pro who can make it personal adaptations, I mean, in the studies, all the therapists have to function exactly the same, right. right? So you don't let the therapist exude their individual brilliance because you want them to function with fidelity to the method because you'll never prove that it works unless the therapist really function quite similarly. But now that we're getting practitioners getting really good at this stuff, they develop toolkits. And the most important thing is engaging the person in the therapy. I mean, if you give, if I did this with a kid who is not engaged, he's not going to do it. So finding the motivational strategy to engage a person in the therapy, begin to engage the family, the time constraints, we run into that all the time. I, I, I can't tell you. There's never a time to take a kid off of medicine. Because they're either in school or they're in a six-week summer camp. I mean, these logical, rational kind of impediments to good treatment are everywhere. And it really is about kind of grounding yourself and making the commitment to doing the kind of work. The, the CBIT stuff, you don't have to do it for the next 60 years. You can learn the principles and you can head things off at the pass. Um, if you will, so you see a new tick coming on and you can develop a competing response for it. You can do that within the privacy of your own home once you're trained up, once you're motivated. You know, the, the thing about behavioral treatments, um, it requires a good therapist and you have to throw yourself into it. Um, you know, if you, if you do this, I'm not so sure, ooh, 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 you're never going to get anywhere with a, with a psychological intervention. So there's two types of reinforcement. Positive reinforcement, that is when somebody does something and you pat them on the back and say, good job, the next time uh, they're more likely to do that behavior again in order to get the pat on the back. That's what paychecks do. Negative reinforcement is much more complicated and you have to listen closely. When you're presented with an irritation, like an itch, and you scratch that itch and you make that go away, the next time you have that irritation, you are more likely to scratch it. Does that make sense? That is negative reinforcement, meaning that when you're presented with something noxious, awful, something you don't like, and you do something to make that go away, you are negatively reinforced, meaning the next time you're presented with that noxious stimuli, you're going to do that same behavior again. Does that make sense? Okay. So the, ex the example I use is uh, 
you know, you get into your car and you try to start it and it doesn't fire up and you get mad and it's a brand new car. So if you can't even look at the engine in those new cars anymore because you can't see anything. And, you know, you're upset, you're going to be late, you kick the tire and you say, oh, let me just try it one more time. And then you put it in and it fires up. The next time you're going to go try and start your car, what are you going to do? You're going to kick the tire. Does it make any sense? No. Do many of the parenting practices I observe in clinic practice make any sense? No. It's because what happens is people find that they do things that make their kids' noxious behavior go away, like yelling, screaming, threatening, arguing, shaming, all kinds of things will make a kid shut down for a little bit of time, right? So that's why parents use those strategies even though they hate using them. It's because at some point or another, one of those coercive kind of strategies got rid of the non-compliant youngster. The problem with that strategy is that kids do the same thing. So they use a foot stomp, an argue, a talk back, a yell, a scream, a temper tantrum, an angry outburst to get parents to back off their expectations. And when the parent says, Billy, you kind of make your bed, and the kid says, no, not today, and the parent says, okay, you can do it tomorrow, at that point, Billy just got trained to say no. So if the parent the next day says, well, you know, Billy, um, you do have to make it today. I let you off easy yesterday. He says, no, no way. I'm not doing it. No way at all. And the parent says, oh, well, God, I didn't realize you felt so strongly about this. Um, okay, we'll, we'll postpone it another day. Billy is now getting trained, got the picture? to use those kinds of strategies to manage day-to-day -day expectation. That's negative reinforcement. When presented with something you don't like and you can make it go away by doing something, you will be negatively reinforced for that. So anything that relieves internal distress, like that sensation in the shoulder or worries about dirt and germs, is internally reinforcing, okay? Now, what we were talking about with the function piece was that kids who have tics and whose parents give them a back rub when their tics are severe, they are getting external positive reinforcement. Does that make sense? Because that kid, when he starts ticking a lot, the parent goes to them, looks at them and says, let me give you a back rub. Let me give you some attention for having bad tics. That is externally and positively reinforcing. External negative reinforcement would be if the youngster has tics and the parents say, well, it's obvious that your tics are getting bad because you're having to do your homework, so we're not going to have you do any more homework and I'll write a note to the teacher tomorrow so that that youngster can actually avoid doing homework. Got what I'm saying? That will be externally reinforcing but using negative reinforcement, not positive reinforcement. I rarely see people who tick get gratification from their tick, which would be internal positive reinforcement. So when we're working on CBIT, the habit reversal component, the competing response, you know, th this instead of that kind of thing, we are really working in this square. But if, in that youngster's life, he's getting a lot of support and attention for having severe tics, or his severe tics allow him to avoid homework or other family responsibilities, we will be working on a behavioral strategy that might work for some of his symptoms, but we won't necessarily have a behavior plan in place for the rest of it. Does that make sense? So part of what I see when I see refractory cases of obsessive compulsive disorder or of Tourette syndrome, when I think about meds and everything else, I also begin to think about what patterns of interaction are there around these symptoms which can sustain them over time. Does that make sense? And what I do is I draw this little two by two square and I sit with the family and we kind of march through how they respond to ticks, how they manage ticks. Um, whether the ticks function to help the youngster escape from situations or whether the ticks function to kind of get additional attention or support. Um, and that, for me, helps me disentangle those relationships and get those relationships kind of back on track again. Does that make sense? 
So what, what we're doing in the behavioral treatment and the stuff that's new, this is old. This has been around the literature for many, many years. All of this stuff, the functional piece, all of this stuff is brand new. I have a very close psychology friend who said, you know, it took you guys 30 years to figure this out. I was doing this back at Stony Brook in the early 1980s. We were getting people with threat better back then doing this behavioral treatment. We knew about Norm Azrin down in Florida. I mean, I, this is no news to me at all. It took a long time for it to get to, to this stage. Uh, and there are other folks who really like, like I said, who like to talk about feelings and emotions and problem solving and coping and adaptation. And they're not all excited about this treatment because it doesn't have a lot of that gushy stuff. It's a real training behavioral kind of treatment. Psychiatrists are kind of the same way. Um, you know, we're, I think the modern ones are increasingly used to thinking about uh, psychiatric disorders as having a brain basis to them, using medicines for some sets of symptoms, but focusing on function and other things using behavioral or rehabilitative strategies. Forgive me, but our neurology colleagues seem to have more trouble with this because they, they, some of them just have trouble with the idea that this is a brain-based disorder. And if you bring up this issue with behavior, that all of a sudden you're going to undermine all the work that we did. We're going to go be going back to Freud and all the horrors that were there. But if you think about really what we're doing here, we are at a full and rich conceptualization that's completely compatible with modern neuroscience. And that is that the brain is what it is, and it functions the way it functions, but it is adaptable and shapeable um, by, uh, by behavioral and environmental forces. And there are some things that are less shapeable. So, you know, we're not trying to cure epilepsy, if you will, with with behavioral factors, but even patients who have epilepsy are taught to learn how to sleep and eat a reasonable diet and maintain their medication status in order to, to, to do that. Primary care doctors have no trouble with this either. They really like using strategies where you think about using medicines and you also think about lifestyle change, and um, so they're comfortable with it. Nurses um, are particularly interested in this because this is something that's right in their bailiwick that they can teach. We've, we're particularly excited about occupational therapists because occupational therapists know, knows, knows the body, they know muscles, they know what a competing response would naturally be. Um, we like occupational therapists because they already see kids with Tourette and developmental disabilities for sensory integration and other stuff. But the other thing is that um, they will get referrals from ENT doctors who see kids for sniffing. They will see them from ophthalmologists who see it for blinking they'll get referrals in a way that's easier than referring to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So we're very excited about creating manuals and supporting materials for occupational therapists to uh, outreach into their community and essentially develop a market for themselves treating kids with tic disorders. Kids love it. Not every kid responds to it, but kids generally like feeling empowered by this. Families are... Uh, you know, if this behavior thing works, what does that mean? I thought only medicine worked. I thought it was a brain condition. Does that mean he really can't control it and he's just been refusing to control it? So families get confused by this, a little bit like some practitioners get confused by this. They wonder what it all means. School personnel, the, the big worry is that school personnel will read something about the study and say, I read that you could control this stuff and so control it or head to the office. Um, that they will go back to the bad old ways of doing it. We've written a couple of nice brochures um, for teachers and educational personnel from the Tourette Syndrome Association. So we're, we're doing outreach around schools in order to make sure that they don't misinterpret the, this important information. Advocacy organizations struggle a little bit too. I think the Tourette Syndrome Association is, is uh, doing an outstanding job of advertising and promoting training in this treatment. Um, but it's tricky. Not everybody within the organization is on the same page about this treatment. So um, for in some, in some uh, corners of the Tourette world, it's still controversial. So um, even though we have more data about behavioral treatment than we have for any other treatment. Why is this complicated? Well, it results in a change in advice. 
In the bad old days, we would say, ignore your ticks. Remember I talked about that early? We want people to become more aware of their ticks. What turns them on, turns them off, when they are, how complicated they are, what leads to what, you know, watching that hand movement. Isn't that interesting how that hand movement before you woo woo was there before you woo wooed and you knew that somewhere in your mind that that was going on? Can't be controlled. Uh, let's figure out a way to manage them. Completely different orientation towards ticks. Don't punish. We agree completely but we do want to reward successful management. So we want parents to know when their kids are working on it and when their kids are having some success that they apply the praise in large doses. Behavioral treatments don't work. Please use behavioral strategies. They're um, almost side effect free. Don't try to suppress. I think I tell people don't white knuckle suppress because it'll make your ticks worse. But um, we also know um, that uh, ticks don't get worse with behavior treatment, believe it or not. Some people think they do or they worry that they do. Suppression worsens ticks. You know, one of the things we've heard patients say for a long time that is if I resist that premonitory urge and, and hold my tick back, my head will pop off or I'll feel so much tension I can't stand it. It'll be so uncomfortable for me that I just won't know what to do. It's going to be so painful and so difficult. But if you think about that Discussion, that's what people with OCD say about the compulsion to wash their hands, that if they worry that they're going to die if they don't wash their hands and you don't let them wash their hands, that feeling rises and rises and rises and rises and so finally pushes them to, to kind of wash their hands. It's the same essential experience with the tick. And what we're finding is if we can give people strategies to disrupt that relationship, that people can actually have a better experience with that premonitory urge and over time the urge seems to dissipate. Suppression worsens the premonitory age. New ticks develop when you suppress. This is one of my favorites. In psychiatry, this is going all the way back to Freud, they had a thing called symptom substitution. So if you ever got rid of a symptom just by kind of making it go away, the idea was that you had this kind of conservation of psychopathologic goo. So if you got rid of one symptom that was related to this psychopathologic goo, the symptom someplace else would pop up. Now, nobody's ever been able to prove this, but this is a old saw within psychiatry and psychology. We're now be hearing, beginning to hear people talk about this, like we have the Tourette, the Tourette goo, that if you suppress a symptom here, it's gonna pop up there, or you suppress that one, it's gonna pop out down here. It's the same logic that's being used. And again, the small studies that have been done to look at this phenomena doesn't look like this actually holds true. By eliminating one symptom, you don't create new symptoms in another place. So what do we do for parent-specific advice? Well, we like advocacy. But that advocacy has been predominantly toward getting the world to shift its appreciation of the struggle that kids have with Tourette. Um, what we're doing now is we're saying to kids with Tourette, you know, you got a tough life. It's going to be a little more difficult. Let's figure out strategies where we can kind of overcome, survive, and become heroic in the face of adversity. The chance that you're going to be able to change a school system or change this person or that person's attitude, that's a lot of work. But to get someone to kind of find a way for them to be personally invested in their own recovery and in their own advocacy and overcoming adversity, that's, believe it or not, a lot easier to do. So take on challenges. Provide comfort. I think you all know that when you provide comfort now to a young person with threat syndrome, you have to do it very carefully. Your timing has to be exquisite. Otherwise, you're going to get into one of those interactive issues. So comfort very carefully. So protective to overprotective. Um, believe it or not, these are strategies where we want to actually, once kids get good behavioral strategies going, we want them to go to difficult situations and begin to master those most difficult situations and apply their tools there. We want them to confront hard to deal with situations. It's not keeping them away from that stuff. It's not facilitating avoidance. Don't think about them. Be mindful. What makes them better? What makes them worse? What are they all about? Give time to tick, take time to manage, ignore the ticks, 
understand their antecedents, the tick behavior, and their consequences. That's the functional part. A reduced stress. I can't tell you. We've got to reduce stress. We've got to take them out of school. We've got to take them out of that peer group. We've got to get them individual tutoring. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. We've got to do whatever. What we're really trying to do is get kids to be able to stress-proof their behavioral strategies so that they can do them under duress or in stressful situations. Does that make sense? Celebrate your specialness. Um, I think Oliver Sacks was one of the very best at getting us to appreciate how special people with Tourette can be. Um, um, that's good. I'm not against that, but we really want to hear about young people who have found their way to kind of manage their tics. And when they do, they and their family should feel really good that they were faced with a challenge and then went on to find their way to manage it. What do we do? Really work on comorbidity. Um, sometimes working on tics, if the anxiety is too severe or the ADHD is too severe, um, you might not be able to get the same kind of outcome. Uh, so we want to make sure that all that's managed appropriately. And then the family and the child intervention for the CBIT lifestyle. So if you think about what we just described, this is a different way of living within a family. <coughs> it should feel that way, hopefully. And getting the family ready to live in that direction is part of getting the readiness for this treatment to have its, have its opportunity for benefit. You can use this as the first treatment. You can use it as a first treatment and add meds. You can have meds and do the behavioral treatment. We actually took an 18-year-old guy, um, a 20-year-old guy, who was on a pretty heavy doses of Pimazide and did uh, CBIT with him over a summer when he was back from college and we're able to get him off his medicines. You want to see an interesting competing response? He, had, he walked like this, wore out the tips of his shoes. So the therapist, who's Matt Speck, said, when you're home walking around the house, I want you to prepare, pretend that each one of your feet is 1,000 pounds. <laughs> so he taught him how to walk mechanically and flat-footed and so when he'd watch TV, go to the kitchen, get something to drink, or go to the bathroom or whatever, he would practice walking with 1,000 foot, 1,000 pound feet. And again, I saw him um, the following fall after he'd returned to school, and he wasn't wearing out his shoes on the tips anymore. So there is some creativity to this treatment, but it really is within this kind of uh, behavioral approach. So what will assessment and treatment look like in the future? Well, that person who notices that first tick will know that that tick by itself is probably meaningless, but it is a marker for neurodevelopmental disturbance and should lead to uh, monitoring for the development of ADHD, anxiety disorders, the other kinds of issues that track with kids with ticks. So if the pediatrician, instead of saying, I don't know what that is, he'll get over it, it'll probably go away, which is what most families tell us their first experience is, says, ooh, that's kind of interesting. Can I redo the family history again? What about anxiety and depression and OCD and ticks in your family? And oh, by the way, you know, this is what we're going to look for over the next years. He's six years old now. ADHD oftentimes presents before age seven. Anxiety presents between six and 10. Depression presents between 13 and 18 for the first time. So we, you know, we'll just increase our vigilance around. And by the way, I want you to kind of begin to think about kind of how you manage your home life. And we have some ideas about how to structure and create a daily routine and to begin to think about um, kind of setting up your home in a way so that you're really working on kind of positive character development, emotion and behavior control, so that your youngster, if he does, you know, develop a tick disorder, he's going to be in a very good place to manage that tick disorder well. I don't know how many pediatricians have that discussion, but my guess is if you had had that with your pediatrician, you'd be going back to them now. That kind of proactive, preemptive, planning kind of treatment that is specific to you, your kid, and your family is the kind of treatment that makes us loyal to the, to the docs who work with us. So that first doc knows the advice. Then the first intervention would be to work with families to provide a non-reinforcing environment for ticks. Parents then would take what works at home to the school and advocate for non-reinforced environment at ticks. Oh my gosh, I just had this the other day. There was, a, there was a kid who had had an outstanding, this was OCD, outstanding med response and had good response to behavioral treatment. 
But his, his parents were extremely solicitous, interested, and curious. And so the kid would come up and say, I think I'm having an OCD thought. And the mom said, oh, really? Tell me about that. And so he would kind of go on and on. But he's getting good grades. He's not in any trouble anywhere. But he's having these interactions around complaining about his OCD symptoms. And I said, you know what? I got a feeling that he's just reassurance seeking and your engagement of that is providing attention and support, positive external reinforcement of, of reassurance seeking, right? So I tell you what, this is what I do with all reassurance seeking. I put it on a schedule. So reassurance seeking can only happen between 4.30 and 4.35 after the snack. So the parent can say, ooh, 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 hold that thought we got another 25 minutes until you can unload all of your worries about things. Well, what happens predictably is when it comes to 4.30 to 4.35, the kid's got nothing to say because they'd rather go out and play. And so what happens is you slowly begin to stop the positive external reinforcement of reassurance seeking. Well, what happened is they had eliminated it at home, but then it was at school. So this family actually went to the school and talked about the strategy that they use for reducing positive external reinforcement of reassurance seeking. And so the school's now doing that. From my point of view, that is a much better way to work with the school where we solve problems in the home and then the people who have actually nailed the issue within the home, they go to school. More oftentimes we see the school is having trouble with the youngster and the and so is the home, but the parents are expecting the school to solve the problem and make it easier for the family at home. Does that make sense? I'm looking to turn that around. I want to empower parents and kids to build the solutions that then they can share with the school, as opposed to expecting the school to solve problems that the family really struggles with even at home. This one, like I said with the six-year-old boy with the tongue thrusting, that intervention took me probably less than a minute, minute and a half to teach. But I had a kind of relationship with a family that's predicated on this kind of work. So I knew about their tics, they knew about me. I saw this kid, I knew it, the, I had the idea about kind of the habit reversal and stuff, so I offered a suggestion. They picked up on it, they went home and worked on it, he practiced it, and boom, you've got something going and it takes very, very little time to do. It's not eight hours of psychotherapy over a 10-week period. It's a minute or two in an office visit around a specific tick teaching a simple, uh, a simple strategy that is embedded in a larger care framework. Does that make sense? That's what it ought to look like. Right now, what's embedded in the larger care framework is, is ticks are worse. Well, okay, let's see where we are with the medicine. Oh, yeah, we're already pretty high dose on that one. There are a couple of new things out. We want to try something new. That's the embedded care framework now around tick management, fair? You quickly go to a discussion about kind of medication strategies. Complicated. And then kids would learn management strategies as they go. And my guess is that in addition to that, they would begin to create their own management strategies over time. Have you guys seen this one? I love this book. Duncan has Tourette lives in Canada, and has written this beautiful book. It's got so much great stuff in it. He says things in it like, you know, you want to wake up before your ticks because if your ticks wake up before you do, your day is going to be toast. Cool, huh? You got to exercise, eat well, because, you know, if you're going to have ticks, you got to be healthy. You got to be strong and healthy. So you might as well eat well, get enough sleep, exercise, because, you know, you got a tough road to go. Those kinds of messages within this book is really the kind of psychology, if you will, that we want to bring to families so that they have the sense of this kind of forward-leaning, pressing, moving kind of um, mastery of, of uh, having a difficult situation. Uh, it's kind of aimed at an adolescent, young adolescent, but I like it. It's a little bit like Rocky and Bullwinkle, you know, it's meant for kids, but adults laugh too, and there's usually a few extra layers of jokes in there. So how do we reconcile all this with it being a neurologic disorder? Every medical disorder has a behavioral treatment and management component to it. So should Tourette. Ticks get worse when you suppress. We have data to suggest it doesn't. 
If you suppress other ticks will get worse, that doesn't seem to happen either. How can one focus on activities if they are suppressing? Um, they're not white knuckle suppressing, they're doing um, kind of intervening strategies, if you will, which are compatible with uh, doing other activities. We actually have a nice video uh, of a young man um, who had learned the treatment and had done well with it. And the skeptic said, you know, what, can he do this stuff and kind of participate in other activities? And so we did a picture of him playing cards with this therapist. And he was doing fine playing cards. And at one point in the video, um, you could begin to see him diaphragmatically breathe. He was talking, he was doing whatever else he was doing, but he shifted from the kind of a routine breathing motion to a diaphragmatic breathing motion while he continued to play cards. So it was a, it was a nice uh, evidence, if you will, about how kids who are trained to do this and practice at this can actually incorporate that and use it in their day-to-day -day living. So these are some of the studies. Not many kids, but the conditions are beautiful. Baseline, reinforced suppression, rebound evaluation. So what happens is they took a baseline uh, tick severity and then they uh, rewarded, they said, you know, for every whatever you're not ticking, they began to dump tokens into the little tray. And so these kids were actually able to find a way to suppress. And it might have actually included white knuckle suppression. And then they stopped doing the reinforcement. And there was rebound. But what people talk about with rebound is rebound above baseline. Right? Got what I'm saying? So yes, ticks come back, but they don't come back worse than baseline. They come back because you're not doing something active to suppress them. Does that make sense? They bounce back up. They did it again. You could get them to suppress again. And again, it rebounds, but it doesn't rebound above baseline severity. So this is the data that people would suggest says that you can suppress ticks without it making ticks worse worse than baseline. Uh, su did substitution, uh, okay, vo vocal ticks decrease, untreated motor ticks did not change or decrease. So this is the idea that if you focus on one symptom and you eliminate that, the pattern of other symptoms doesn't change and new symptoms don't develop in the repertoire to account for the one tick that was managed. Does that make sense? And then we've also known that stress makes uh, ticks worse and they tried to pick apart just what stress does and it looks for them, as they do this, that stress makes it more difficult for people to use their tick management strategies. So it's not a direct effect of stress on ticks, but it is a direct effect on people's capacities to manage themselves more effectively. Does that make sense? So when we talk about stress-proofing kids with this treatment, it is really getting them to be able to do the strategies under difficult circumstances. And now for something completely different. Everybody ready? Fasten your seatbelt. I think I may have to sit down for this. It's got nothing to do with the brain. It's only got to do with the spinal cord. Anybody heard of this? So there's a couple of dentists actually in this area who are doing this treatment. And um, they think about Tourette syndrome as a structural reflex disorder. And they use what they call a neurocranial vertical distractor. Essentially what they say happens with Tourette's is, and you know this from watching kids grow up, their heads grow like, you know, parts of it kind of move in different places. So essentially what they're saying is happening is there is a, um, a disconnected growth, if you will, in the face around the time that kids develop ticks. And um, it's asynchronous, so some parts grow bigger, whatever. And when the lower jaw gets misaligned with the rest of the face, it puts pressure on the trigeminal nerve, which actually goes through the jaw and up into the top of the spine. That compression and irritation of that nerve is a little bit like a chronic funny bone thing, right? That ascends up into the upper spinal cord 
and is both in the sensory and motor area of the spinal cord where all of the motor and sensory nerves are tracking right next to each other, like sitting on top of each other. They even pass through the same reticular activating system area. The idea is that that irritation that starts here works up the nerve and begins to irritate that whole motor sensory component of the upper spinal cord. And that that irritation, that that irritation can actually cause ticks in the shoulder, trunk, easy in the face, right? Because it's kind of all in the facial area. Um, and so what do they do? They put in a prosthesis, a, a oral prosthesis, to put the jaw in a position that decreases tick severity. So we've heard many, many things at the Tourette Syndrome Association, but when we heard this, it was like, oh, God. <laughs> so what our traditional approach has been is we say to them, prove it. And most of them have said, no, we're too busy saving lives and making children happy to spend any time doing that bogus research crap. But these guys said, bring it on, we'd be happy to. We don't know how to design a trial to make sure that it's rigorous and that it'll work, but um, you know, we're so confident, we are really happy to put this under unbelievable scientific scrutiny in a very public way. So we said, all right. <laughs> so the clinical trials group of the Tread Syndrome Association has met with these guys, looked at what they're doing, and we figured out a, a design, it's preliminary still, to actually test this treatment out. This is that part of the face, goes through the jaw there. That's where all the irritation starts. And then it goes back up to this area of the brain where all the sensory and motor stuff goes. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that there would be irritation and that that irritation would, would uh, result in kind of a spontaneous firing of motor neurons and that that irritation would be also responsible for the sensory component that might be involved. So it's not a bad model but it doesn't have anything to do with the basal ganglia or striatocortical circuitry or any, you know. oh golly, just think if this is true, it's not a brain disease anymore. So essentially what they do is they take the mandible and they move it down and forward. So they use tongue depressors, start with one, then two, then three, then four, and it's three, four, five, six tongue depressors. But while they're, while they're, they're not even biting down on the tongue depressor because I thought, you know, having a six tongue depressors in your mouth is a little bit like, <laughs> right? It's, it could easily be a competing response. Um, but then they get the tongue depressors in and they have them move the jaw forward so that the incisors are uh, on top of each other as opposed to a, that slight overbite that's normal, right? Most of us have the front teeth on top. They just want you to move it for a little bit so it's all lined up. So the way they discovered this is they had patients with Tourette and temporomandibular joint dysfunction. So they put this in there to cure the TMJ. And what they saw is that when they fixed the TMJ, the ticks just went down. So then they began to do it just on standard folks. So they have this idea about the capacity to open a mouth wide, which I can do and I don't have ticks. But they suggest that people who will respond to this will have a click, so they have some temporomandibular joint dysfunction, or they can't really open their mouth wider than I think it's 45 millimeters from the bottom of the top incisors to the top of the bottom incisor. So they figure out what the, what the proper number of tongue depressors are, and you'll see the kids coming back, and then they build an appliance that is kind of separating the teeth and pulling the jaw forward a little bit. And remember when I said one of the habit reversal strategies for head and neck ticks was to do this? I thought, oh my God. I wonder if we're doing some kind of something with one of our habit reversal techniques that picks up on this. Um, so there's speech training. And then long term, in, in a developing child, you would expect that this prosthesis might actually allow the, like, um, orthodontics allow the bone structure of the face to shift a little bit so that it could actually function as a curative intervention where you could remove the orthotic and that jaw would now be positioned in a new place. 
They've also talked about surgical restructuring of the TMJ joint, which I thought, oh my gosh, we don't really want to be chasing that. Let, let's see if we can prove this thing first. <laughs>